Hey everybody, welcome back to the Sax Tuition YouTube channel. My name is Jeremy. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the difference between jazz and classical saxophone, specifically the differences in tone as well as the differences in embouchure and mouthpiece selection. Now, before we get into it, if you're just starting out on the saxophone and you're not sure where to start, check out lesson one of the Sax Tuition Beginner Series. I've put a link to it in the description below. So let's get into it. Now, the first thing I think I should mention is that I am primarily a jazz player. That's where most of my training has come from, but I am very interested in classical technique. So much so that for my graduate thesis paper, I wrote it on bridging the two traditions by utilizing classical saxophone articulation techniques in jazz performance. Very nerdy, I know. So it should be said that what you're really getting here is a jazz player's perspective on the differences between the jazz and classical saxophone worlds. And even then there'll be some differences of opinion depending on who you ask. Now, the first thing that strikes me about classical players is how much tonal control they're able to get from playing quite close to the end of the mouthpiece. Now, you might have seen in one of my tone tips videos how drastically the sound can change depending on how much mouthpiece you have in your mouth. If you haven't, here's a quick example. Now, the reason why classical players tend to use less mouthpiece in their mouth than jazz players comes down to one word, blend. In the classical world, the saxophones often need to blend with an orchestra. With the other woodwinds, sure, but also with the violins, the violas, the cellos, and the double basses. So their concept of sound is warm, centered, rounded, just like this. So how do you achieve that sound? Well, one way is to develop a lot of control without using too much mouthpiece in your mouth when you play. Why? Well, as you go further on the mouthpiece when you play, the tone changes quite a lot. It gets edgier, it gets honkier, until eventually you lose control of the sound altogether. Jazz players, well, they usually like a little bit more edge in their sound, so they will tend to use more mouthpiece when they play. Now, don't get me wrong here, blend is still important for jazz players too, but when you think about what instruments they're blending with, it's the drum kit, the bass, guitar, piano, vocals. So the tonal landscape is just a lot different. As we get into more contemporary music, talking about pop, rock, and R&B, there's a lot more amplification of the band. And perhaps there's even some electronics and synthesizers involved. So it's not uncommon for saxophones playing in those genres to sound especially bright and edgy. Now, the actual mouthpiece itself also has an important part to play in determining your sound. Classical players tend to prefer smaller tip openings and chambers that give them a lighter, more immediate response when they play, meaning they can get precise articulation and a large dynamic range without needing to use too much air. Jazz players, as you can probably guess, often prefer the opposite. They like having to push a little bit harder and use more air to play to get a fat sound. And a larger tip opening and a wide open chamber encourages that style of playing. Finally, some mouthpieces take it a step further again by introducing a baffle into the design. A baffle works by compressing the air that's blown into the mouthpiece into a faster jet. It's the same effect that you can get from a water hose by covering part of the end with your thumb. The water shoots out faster and it also travels further. The effect this has on the saxophone sound is that it makes it extra fat and bright. Think Dave Sanborn, Mindy Bear, Candy Dolfer, Mike Phillips, Mike Brecker, Dave Coz. Players in the R&B and fusion genres use it to great effect. Now, if you're just starting out on the saxophone, you might be pricking your ears up right now thinking, yes, that's me. That's the sound that I want to get. And whilst I think that it's awesome that you've got a goal in mind for your sound, 
don't rush out and buy one of these artist mouthpieces for four or five hundred dollars just yet because they also take a lot of embouchure control to be able to play confidently and in tune. To start on one of these mouthpieces too early would make everything so much harder on the saxophone. Instead, give yourself at least six to 12 months to get acquainted with your starter mouthpiece. That could be the mouthpiece that just came in your case, or it could be my personal recommendation, which is a Yamaha 4C. After you've eliminated the squeaks on that and you're confident that you can get a clear and consistent sound without any wobbles, then you can start to think about moving to a more specialized mouthpiece. So I've put together a small selection of mouthpieces under $200 that fit the sound profiles that we've talked about. Now, these are professional mouthpieces. If you buy one of these mouthpieces, you may never need to buy another mouthpiece again. But part of the reason why I've selected them is because of their playability. They're relatively easy to transition to if you're used to playing a Yamaha 4C or equivalent. For a classical tone, there's the Selma Concept, a beautiful mouthpiece which I actually use on my soprano sax to help achieve a nice rounded tone and take some of the soprano's natural edge off. You would have heard that mouthpiece in action in my soprano saxophone video. For a traditional jazz sound of the 40s and 50s, I've selected the Mayer G-Style mouthpiece, which I use on my alto saxophone, and you would have heard me play on any of my alto sax comparison videos. Here's a small taste. And finally, for a bright sound, I've selected the Claude Lakey Five Star Three mouthpiece. It's certainly not the brightest sax mouthpiece out there, but it's versatile. It plays with more edge than the Mayer mouthpieces, if that's what you're going for. And it makes sense for an intermediate player because you should find it quite easy to transition to. Now, I actually used to own this mouthpiece about 10 years ago, but unfortunately I don't have it anymore. So I can't play test it for you. But if you do a quick online search, I know there's some videos out there showing off this mouthpiece. So I just want to leave you with this. We could talk all day about hard rubber versus metal mouthpieces, tip openings, chamber sizes, uh, reed and ligature combinations, but ultimately the best equipment you have is already with you. It's your ears. Once you have a strong foundation on the instrument, it's really important to just experiment with some of the variables in your embouchure. You know, how much mouthpiece are you using? What's the curl like? in your bottom lip? What's the shape of your mouth when you play? And how much air are you using? All of these sorts of things can have a big effect on your sound. Because ultimately, everyone arrives at their own unique concept and their own unique sound. And that's one of the truly great things about playing the saxophone. Well guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. As I said at the start, if you're looking to start the saxophone from scratch and you want a really strong foundation, check out the Sax Tuition Beginner Series. It's a complete package for learning the saxophone online. There's 12 lesson videos, an ebook, uh, 200 plus play along tracks, and you can watch lesson one for free right here on YouTube. And as I said, I've left a link for that in the description below. I've also got links for the mouthpieces I talked about, so you can check them out as well. Hit like on the video and subscribe to the Sax Tuition YouTube channel for more great saxophone content, and I'll see you all again soon.